Thank you, everybody, for coming to this uh, talk with us today. It's uh, May 2022, and um, we are going to be talking today about nourishing the soul from our perspective of um, our shamanic work with the spirits and of living uh, an animistic life. And we really look forward to hearing your questions as we talk. We don't know exactly how long this talk will be. Um, maybe around an hour, a little bit more, a little bit less. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, once we start, we see where it goes. Good. So we just begin by arriving here today. Let yourself catch up with your soul. Or let your soul catch up with you. Mm. Sometimes we go so fast and our mind is running around all over the place. And the mind is a wonderful part of human life. But it is only one part. We also have a body and we have a soul. And to some extent we have a spirit. And we're not going to talk so much about that today. The diff Sometimes people want to know... What is the difference between the soul and the spirit? But uh, uh, we'll talk later on why we don't feel these definitions are so important. And you can find out. You can find out. <laughs> but we want to talk today about nourishing the soul. And uh, Jonathan, when you started teaching, whatever it is, some 30, 35, 40 years ago, um, there was this uh, work uh, coming out a lot, which was about soul retrieval. And um, you've been working, we have been working, uh, doing a lot of soul retrieval and working with people who have soul loss. But today we decided to talk about another aspect, which is the nourishment of the soul. But we're just going to start off talking a little bit about, about that, about your experience of soul and soul loss, mm -hmm. soul retrieval, just mm -hmm. briefly. Yeah, it's actually... Uh... For me, it started off, um, I think it was in January of 1987. Interestingly enough, I can really put an exact date on it when uh, a, a Sami woman came on a, a workshop with me. And uh, on about the second or third day, she came up to me in one of the breaks. And she said to me, as follows, someone has stolen my soul. Can you get it back? All right. And uh, this was, I had been teaching shamanism for a few years and practicing for a few years more than that. And this was the first time anybody had ever said that to me. And uh, that was the start. And it was, it was very interesting. Uh, a lot of people, there's a lot of drama in saying that somebody stole my soul. And in some cases, it's absolutely true. But in, in most cases, uh, it's generally not purely that somebody has stolen somebody else's soul. There's a, a combination of things. And, and part of that combination is that... Uh, I found most often is that, uh, in fact, we give our souls away, uh, hoping for a result. And we're not aware of the fact that we're giving our soul away when we do it. We're just trying to perhaps bring someone into our lives. This is a, a very common way that it happens. Yes. and. Uh... Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a bad thing. There doesn't have to be um, bad intentions at work. It could be because we really want to please somebody. We really want to help somebody, maybe a little bit too much. Mm. Maybe we feel that um, we can help the situation by giving a little bit of ourselves away. And often, like you say, we're not even aware of it. It's very, very, very common. Mm. And... Um, it can also happen that over a long period of time, there's like a drip, drip, drip effect. Mm. And so it just sort of wears away like, mm. like a water on rock. Mm. For example, uh, uh, one 
uh, area of life that is uh, seeing a lot of soul loss is parent-child, right? And uh, for example, the child wants to please the parents and uh, keeps trying and trying and trying and trying. And maybe that child has a, a sibling who is the so-called favorite, right? And so no matter how much uh, the second child tries, just doesn't go anywhere. The parents can only see the favorite. This is just a very general example. And it can also work the other way around where the parent is trying to get their child's attention. And uh, this, this is just very basic kind of stuff. And uh, in fact, uh, on our website, I have an article mm -hmm. about soul loss and soul retrieval. And uh, Sandra Ingman has written a classic uh, book about uh, soul retrieval, and it's called Soul Retrieval by Sandra Ingman. It's, and it's, uh, it's a really good one. And we find that um, in our work, or when we talk about the spirits, there are some people who are really interested in coming to work shamanically and learning to work with the spirits. But there are also many people who are not, but even the people who don't really want to hear the word spirit or spirits, they often respond to the word soul. Very, very many people respond to the word soul in a way that's also like, almost like you can feel what it is and even if you also if you look in general parlance in mass media in very often you will find the word soul included mm -hmm. you might not find a lot of soulfulness mm -hmm. you might not find the presence of soul but you'll find the word and the concept and, and the idea and i think that's a very wonderful thing and so many people come to us and when they hear this uh, phrase soul loss again it's almost like it rings a bell Bingo. Yeah. you you don't know maybe what it means mm -hmm. but you can feel yes I, I i resonate with that i recognize that and uh, the reason a lot of people recognize it is that uh, a lot of people <clears throat> i think probably almost everybody uh, has a, a certain amount of soul loss mm -hmm. and it can happen so many different ways and being human beings uh, our lives are filled with all kinds of events you know maybe you had a bicycle accident when you were five years old right or fell off your tricycle or something that might do it uh, for me uh, i had a, a rather amazing experience when i was a soldier in vietnam uh, two nights before i returned from the war, I was waiting for a plane to take me out, and uh, and we came under a mortar attack, and I had an out of body experience. Uh, it was it was uh, very traumatic, and out of body experiences are wonderful opportunities for soul loss. I was very lucky because uh, I felt my soul returning to me almost immediately. But it, it was a big, a big, big experience. And it, it can happen in a lot of ways, many, many different ways. And we're not going to dwell so much about that tonight. Uh, what we want to talk about mainly is the care of the soul. Mm. Uh, because when you care for the soul, there's a very good chance that it will want to stick around. If you don't care for the soul, uh, there's a pretty good chance that it might say, bye-bye. And this doesn't mean you're going to die. It means that you're going to lose a part of yourself. It might not be total soul loss. In fact, it probably won't be. But it could be a partial soul loss. And uh, this is another story, and this is best avoided by taking care of your soul. And again, um, before we 
dive into that, I just want to say a couple more things about um, often again, when people come to us, they have an idea of the soul part that they lost. And so sometimes they come and say, I would like that soul part back because this happened to me at this age and that was very difficult or traumatic. And, and it could be very, very true that there is some soul loss from that part, like a little splinter spit, splitting off. But very often when we do the work of uh, bringing the soul back home to somebody, it is not we who decide, and it's certainly not the client who decides, it, it is the spirits who decide. And the spirits often say, um, no, maybe they're not ready, they have to go back and do some preparation, and here is some other good medicine and power they can take as they prepare. Or they say, that soul part isn't ready to come back yet, but here are two other soul parts that really want to uh, join, that are ready. And so we always, we never sort of work to order, we always just go to the spirits and ask them what is the one that is most uh, appropriate to come back now. And we only ever bring back one or two at a time so that it isn't better if you have five or 15 or 50. In fact, it's just very overwhelming. And maybe we'll do another talk about actually bringing this all back home. But part of this is that uh, sometimes the soul that the person wants back, mm. right? like uh, the time they were in the house that caught on fire and they managed to escape with their life by jumping out of the second story window. Now, woo -woo. So they know definitely, I, I lost a part of myself that time, but maybe that part is not ready to come back until one or two other parts come back first and, and prepare the way. So this is good things to consider. So nourishing the soul is, is not so much about, uh, you know, oh, I want to find someone who can help me bring my soul back. And it's always good to do this with someone who knows how to do it for a lot of reasons that we're not going to go into here. But if you don't have the opportunity to do that, there are many things you can do yourself that, uh, as Jonathan, you were saying before, is about this sort of everyday tending of the soul, things that we can all do for ourselves that is appreciating the soul that we do have, that, that cares for it, that learns to hear it and um, touch it. And most of us live in a society where the soul is not really given a lot of room to thrive. We live in a very material society, a very consumerist society. Competitive. A very competitive, a very visual society. All of these things are not necessarily bad for the soul, in themselves but when the balance is so strong that it's mainly that and very little room for what i like to call the richness of the soul the richness that the soul and soulfulness brings to our lives and some of you might have heard uh, the term gross national happiness which was originally uh coined in bhutan and actually bhutan uses it instead of the bnp uh, so instead of, of looking at the, the gross national um, income of a country in money, the, the gross national happiness uses seven, I think it is, different terms, which are also to do about the well-being of society, the well-being of soul, and um, a lot of other aspects. And I can put in a, a link later on mm -hmm. to that. And, and this is beginning to go beyond the material and say, the soul is valuable. The soul is so valuable, maybe one of the most valuable things we have. When we are born into this life, our soul arrives here on earth and lives in a human body until we uh, die and leave. So the soul is sort of mysterious and, and bigger than life on earth, but it is part of life on earth and it is this beautiful earth warp that is the soul in the human body or the soul on earth that is the real wonder I think about life and, and we very much work with that that it's not about trying to be somewhere else it's trying to be here as much as possible and my ex personal experience is the more you have your soul with you the easier it is to be really here in life and really enjoy life on earth while you're here. And uh, so this leads to the obvious uh, 
conclusion that the soul likes it when we are present. And, and this is so difficult because uh, not all of us are really brought up to be present. Uh, I remember being told when I was five years old, you have to think about your future. You know? Future, what's that? Tomorrow, you know? That's my five-year-old speaking. Yeah, and uh, the Buddhist would say, future, oh, that's right now. Right? And, and this is uh, something that so many of us are caught up in with, because that's the way our society is oriented. And so if, if we totally disregard the way our society is oriented, this is not going to make life easier for us. So it's to find out what is the balance for each of us between it's the same old story between the doing and the being. And the listening and the speaking. And the listening and the speaking. Mm. Right. Because it's often I find in the the pauses, the silences, the stillness. Ah, that's where the soul can begin to breathe and maybe begin to hear itself heard. And if we have never done any active work with trying to connect with our soul or communicate with it, it can be difficult to know how to begin, but it can be very, very simple. Many people feel that if they are quiet, maybe out in nature, maybe if they are doing some journaling, writing, maybe if they're listening to music or dancing, all these things are, are creating space, a sense of spaciousness. And instead of the soul being kind of tightly curled up, it's like a, a bud, a flower bud. It begins to blossom. It begins to stretch. It begins to feel that it is, has some freedom, some freedom to, to move and to roam around and breathe. Yeah, what well, you were just saying, it reminds me of, of uh, uh, an incredible awakening moment in my life. Uh, it can happen anywhere any time. And this one happened uh, on the corner of uh, 14th Street and 7th Avenue in New York City. And I think it was about 1967 or 68. And uh, I was hurrying uh, to get the, the subway uh, up to the university where I was studying at the time. And I had come back from the war in Vietnam, as I mentioned a moment ago. And uh, I was very much involved in the anti-war movement and very much involved. And, and it was kind of tearing me apart. And uh, I came to the newsstand and I knew the newsman. We'd been, I'd been buying papers from him for a year and a half. And I bought my paper and we exchanged our usual wisecracks with each other. And then I looked around the news stall and there was Time magazine and it had a quote on the cover, nobody's picture, just a quote. And it was a quote from uh, a man called Philip Berrigan, who was a Roman Catholic priest and a very outstanding a peace activist and a very good friend of Thich Nhat Hanh. And the quote was, the Buddha said, don't just do something, stand there. And I could just feel my whole body relaxing. You know? And somebody whispering in my ear, you know, if you don't get the next train, there'll be another one in a minute and a half. 
and uh, that that was a, a changing moment in my life. And uh, that was uh, thanks to Time magazine, <laughs> a moment uh, where I felt what it was like to care for my soul. So a really simple thing that we can all do, can do right now, is to bring a little bit more space into our day. Um, and that can be very difficult for some of us. And there's a lot of stress, an epidemic of stress, and an epidemic of um, emptiness. And, but a little bit, just a little bit, you know, maybe it's just three breaths, or maybe it's just one breath, or maybe it's just one moment standing. Or maybe if you wait for the bus, instead of looking on your phone, just look out, just be in the world. Be in the world, allow yourself to be in the world. Sometimes I feel like I run so fast, I wake up in the night and my soul is sort of knocking, you know, on my head or on my heart saying, hey, wait, wait. So that's the very first thing you can do is very simple. Just give a little bit of space, even if you don't know if your soul is speaking to you, if you don't know if you can hear it, if you don't even know if it's there. Begin by making some space. And if you do that on a regular basis, just, you know, just say, this moment is just for me. This moment is for me to come into contact with life and with myself. And maybe in one minute, you will begin again. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly huge thing to do, to come into contact with life and yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? It might, it might uh, sound like doing nothing, but it is very essential care for the soul. And it's so simple and so huge at the same time, but not the kind of hugeness that takes your power. It's the kind of hugeness that gives you power it because it connects you. Mm -hmm. It connects you to the world and to yourself at the same time. And it begins to, to fill you up. It begins to fill you up with, with good things, with real nourishment. And um, there's so much soul loss and soul longing in the world, in the consumerist world, I see. And we try so hard. We actually recognize that. Many of us, you know, subconsciously or unconsciously, we feel that. We feel there's an emptiness in our lives. And so we try all sorts of things to, to stuff ourselves fuller, you know, with uh, stuff we buy or experience, wild experiences that we have or sex, drugs and rock and roll or status, money, success, anything, you know, to just fill that emptiness. But the thing is, mm. if you try to fill an emptiness of the soul with material stuff it doesn't really have much effect and so then you know consumerism comes in and says have more have more because you never have enough you know and the soul is just lying down and, and crying on an empty beach so stop all that mm -hmm. and just stop and begin to make space and you can find that like in a garden the soul will just begin to grow by itself if there's just a little space and then the next thing that is really wonderful to do again very very simple is to listen to stop to make space and to listen and on our courses we teach people lots of different ways to to listen what you like to call deep listening jonathan we use a talking piece uh we learn how to go out and listen to nature we learn how to listen to the spirits we learn how to listen to ourselves with various writing exercises and meditations but you can just start right now just starting if you sit in some stillness maybe once a week you can have five minutes where you ask your heart what do you want to tell me today or just say hello soul i don't know you very well i don't know where you are or who you are but tell me what, do you, what are you longing for? What are you longing for? This word longing, I think, is, is very uh, right for the soul. And maybe you will not hear anything right there and then. 
and maybe you'll hear something that night when you sleep or next morning or in two days time again just make space for the soul to begin to maybe silently creep up and, and whisper into your ear and uh, you said five minutes maybe once a week <laughs> but uh, those of those of you who meditate know that it's really best to do it every day mm -hmm. every day and it's a gift uh, we can give ourselves whether it's just to go out and stand in your favorite corner of the garden or sit in your favorite chair in the kitchen wherever someplace uh, we we talk about power places you know? mm -hmm. and uh, power places can be anywhere as long as you feel uh, yourself in alignment with the world right so it can be as i said in a kitchen chair or a spot in your garden or maybe it's a place that uh, you visited when you were a child and you never forget and so you can just close your eyes and think of that place and just be present in the moment right? and it doesn't take long it doesn't take long you can do that for two minutes if you mm. but better to do it for the two minutes than not to do it at all mm. some people like to do it for half an hour yeah and the wonderful thing about the caring for the soul is is that really maybe you don't need to do it for a really long period of time it doesn't take that much amazingly mm. if we just drip 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 little drops of water to a very thirsty soul it begins to quickly awaken and and come back to life again it's it's really amazing and another thing if you like to draw or um, write to just take 15 minutes every morning or every night or two or three times a week and again just ask yourself a question you know or write a letter to your soul dear soul what do you want to tell me today and then just listen and then write or draw and see what comes and if we do this regularly it doesn't like you were saying earlier it doesn't become so dramatic you know it's not this huge thing that has to happen it's the regular tending just like we brush our teeth every day you know we look after our soul a little bit every day yes and uh, one of my teachers Thich Nhat Hanh, he talks about uh, the tooth brushing meditation <laughs> right and and what he means by that is when you're brushing your teeth be aware of the fact that you're brushing your teeth right? don't be thinking i've only got 42 seconds to brush my teeth because then i've got to run out the door and while i'm running out the door i've got to find that telephone number in my mobile telephone and give that person a call no 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 right when you're brushing your teeth just Oh, thank God! I still have most of my teeth, you know, and and brush away. Right? It comes back to being present. Being you? present, mm -hmm. yes. When you drink a glass of water, Thich Nhat Hanh calls this the water drinking meditation. And for him, his day moved from one meditation to another, to another, to another. It takes a little practice, but. Uh, but the practice is not to get us anywhere. The practice is just to enjoy the practice. And uh, this is the wonderful thing about soul care. It, it is not meant to really bring us anywhere. It's just meant to enjoy our time with ourselves as a soulful being. And, and this is the third way that I think is very easy to, to nourish the soul, apart from creating some spaciousness and listening. It's also about appreciation. Um, many of us are, are worried about who we are and are we good enough and um, and they can be very good questions but there is this part of ourselves that I feel is, is bigger than life it's bigger than my birth family it's bigger than my career it's it's our soul you know when it comes here onto into 
life on the earth and it's every soul is is to be appreciated so and appreciating isn't like necessarily patting yourself on the back and saying well done and like oh i'm so great and it's got nothing to do with that it's got to do with appreciation of being alive and feeling that i'm not just an empty husk i'm not just a machine i'm a living being with a living soul what could be a greater miracle than that and just enjoying that mm -hmm. and and this is this is a, a great stumbling block for a lot of people right uh, so many people uh, that i've talked with do not feel worthy right and this is often due to soul loss right? something that has happened to them right? and so you you can you know say all these things that we've been saying to somebody who really doesn't feel worthy why am i alive what am i doing here I hate this. And so the trick I find is to help them to find something that they love. Just one thing, just one thing. And the interesting thing is that almost everyone has something they love. And uh, it's, it's really quite wonderful. And when you finally help somebody to, to find that one thing that they love, then they realize that all of a sudden, they're not as worthless as they thought they were. They, they have love in their heart. And I learned this, uh, interestingly enough, from a woman who was uh, sitting on a street on the pavement, leaned up against the bank. The bank was closed. It was eight o'clock at night. And she had a, a tin cup in front of her, and, and she was wrapped up in a blanket. And, and I thought, oh, that poor woman. And uh, so I reached in my pocket uh, and found uh, a quarter. This was back when I was living in America. And uh, put it in her cup. And she said, I said to her, how are you doing? And she said, you know, I, it's, it's really great. And like my teeth almost fell out of my mouth. And I said, oh, you know. And she said, yes, you know, I meet so many nice people. And, and I have my, my wonderful dog here. And, and the dog started wagging his tail, you know. And it was just this amazing scene. And because it was the total opposite of what I was expecting. Right? Here this person had so little. Who knows where she was going to spend the night, you know. But for her life was good and you know at that point you know i was feeling a little ragged myself but i was the one who had the money in the pocket and uh, i walked away from her thinking oh life is pretty good for her what am i doing you know and then i started trying to find out and that is uh another big part of um, caring for the soul, of bringing nourishment for the soul is change. And that's when we start moving into maybe bigger aspects of nourishing the soul, where the soul is knocking and knocking and knocking and saying, you've got to change. I need change. I need change. I need something else. And it could be that things are pretty good. I mean, I, I have experienced mm. this in my life for a long time. I was in a 
situation in my life where I, I enjoyed it and it was good. I had a good job and a good relationship and a nice place to live and everything was great for a long time. And then more and more, I had this creeping feeling that, you know, this, this wasn't enough and it wasn't anything about having a better job or better money or a bigger house. No, it was, I could just feel that this wasn't enough for me and the only way I could explain it because to the outside it looked great and it was great it was nice it was a nice life but my soul was saying you know you can live this life and this will be a fine life but I will be half asleep or you can live this other life where I will be fully awake and, and vibrantly alive and we can be alive like really fully alive and so uh, it took me about two years and then I was pretty scared. And then in the end, I said to myself, yeah, I really hear you now. And it got to the point where the, the fear of changing was less than the pain of not changing. As you might have heard many times before, there are some beautiful books about this where the fear of not changing eventually gets less than the pain of not changing. So the risk in changing and all that you lose, you know, uh, doesn't matter because you're taking, you're opening space for the soul to say, come on, come on, come on. And so these are the times to listen. Sometimes I've also experienced several times in my life that I have gone through health challenges or illnesses and they have actually been the soul saying to me, time to change on a very deep level. And if you listen to our talk on shamanic healing, you'll hear how we work with healing, that it's not just about alleviating symptoms, but about transforming the way we live. And the soul plays a big part in this. And then I say, I'm so afraid, I don't know. And the soul says, that's okay. You know, we'll go on this journey together and we'll find our way. And so we keep listening to the soul. We keep appreciating it and giving it space. And then we ask for help to step into the changes that we feel we want to make. And I, I want to say something here about want and need that we talk a lot mm. about because this idea of... <clears throat> being free to be ourselves. We're gonna talk more about this uh, soon. And I also want to answer this wonderful question in the chat about uh, helping children to be in touch with their souls. We're definitely gonna come onto that very soon. Um, but this thing about being true to myself and being free to be myself, it is not in this way of uh, want. It's not in the way of ego that, I want to do whatever I want to do and I want to have whatever I want to have and everything, my truth is the most important. It's not really about that. that the soul doesn't really care about that. The soul cares about being alive, about being connected, about being a part of the bigger picture of the whole. And when we do that, there's all sorts of ebbs and flows, there's all sorts of negotiations and compromises, there's all sorts of teachings that we learn all the time. It's not about having this perfect life where I get everything, you know, that's the consumerist uh, romantic ideal. It's about being alive and meeting challenges as they come and listening maybe not so much to what I want, but what I need. What do I need? Mm. Yeah. And I, I remember, I don't know, still the same way, but uh, years ago, one of the worst things that you could say about somebody was, he's very needy, right? And uh, it, it took me a couple of years because I, I kind of knew what they were talking about in a way, but then I realized what what they're really saying is he's very honest and he dares dares to show this honest in maybe in not a very complimentary way self-complimentary way uh nobody likes to be thought of as being needy but uh i think uh perhaps uh it's even worse to be thought of as being greedy 
I don't know. And we can we can chew on that one for a little while. Uh, but we all are needy. Everybody needs something and uh, can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. And, what and the people who uh, don't need something, it's probably because they are suffering from incredible soul loss and they don't dare ask for what they need. And uh, I remember, I'm sorry, I don't have it here now. There's uh, one poem by Rumi uh, where he says, you must ask for what you really want. I'm not talking about a big Cadillac car. And uh, one day, it was actually one night about uh, many years ago, I was in a bar talking to a friend of mine and she said to me, what do you really want? And I heard myself say, peace of mind. And it was another one of those moments. And when you ask yourself, when you ask yourself, what do I really want? Not, oh, I'd like this and this and this and all of that. That is, they're really symptoms of a deeper wish. So what is your deep wish, your longing? Not expressed in material terms. Is there something you feel maybe right now, today, that your soul longs for, that you really need, that is beyond good and bad and, you know, what is it worth or does anybody else appreciate that? Is there something that you really need to do or to find or to be? Something you need more of in your life so that your soul can breathe and be content and at peace and joyful. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move on and uh, see these wonderful questions and we'll definitely try and get to the questions. But I want to move on a little bit to how do we recognize soul nourishment and, and what are the different types of soul nourishment? And, you know, we don't really go in for trying to define what is soul or what is soul nourishment and all these things because it's so different from person to person. Can we just appreciate that the soul is there and each person might want to define it in a different way. It might feel and look different every day. So let's not hem it in, you know, put it in a cage. Let it roam free. Let it be undefinable. Let it be what it is and have a different relationship to it just by touching and being in love mm. with life, with your soul. Being in love, right? N not necessarily even with anything or anyone, but just being in love. That's the place to be. And it happens. We've all, we've all experienced it. Not necessarily because of this wonderful person we're sitting next to or sitting across the table from. Right? Not necessarily because of that, but maybe, maybe because all of a sudden your soul stops you and says, pay attention. And then you realize it's this beautiful Sunday afternoon in May and you're standing right next to that little cherry tree in your backyard. This, this too is being in love. Because the feeling in your heart just grows and grows. And there's 
no reason for it. It doesn't have to be a reason. It's because you are experiencing this beautiful essence of life. And I feel when I begin to fill up on soul nourishment in this way, in small, regular ways, I become aware more and more of how much there is. So instead of feeling like there's not enough, I don't have enough of time or money or love or success or, you know, all these things that I wish for, I begin to open up to how much there is every day. And my soul can enjoy that bird song or that beautiful fresh water I have to drink. And it's, it's not in a kind of facetious or false optimism. Uh, it is a recognition of life and it is in coming into touch with life. And the more I do that, the more I just feel like I want to be alive and the more I feel I am here and the more I just want to meet life. I just want to see what life brings today. And I stop worrying so much about what I seemingly don't have as just engaging with the richness of life. And so when we nourish the soul, we come into contact with this richness, this richness of the soul and the richness of life. And I found that what happens is I make better decisions for myself because I am more in touch with life, with the essence of life. And then I can make good decisions, you know, from day to day about what I want to say yes to, what I want to say no to, who I want to help, where I want to go, what challenges I have to take on. But this, this filling up with this richness of life that is here all the time and our soul begins to touch the soul that is present in nature, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. And it becomes joyful. So there are some really simple ways to, to recognize nourishment of the soul and to, to uh, actually make sure you receive it as well. And um, we just mentioned a few that, that we feel are very good. Um, one of the main thing is joy and playfulness. Uh, freedom to move and explore. Um, there's some really wonderful work around uh, joy and playfulness. And often we can think that that is kind of silly or something to do in your free time or, you know, something that might be nice, but it's not that important. But actually, it's really, really important to life. And there's really wonderful research uh, about animals and play, playfulness that shows that playfulness is not only how they learn to live in a good way, but they also do it for the sheer exuberance, the exuberance. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the exuberance of being alive, but also of connecting with each other. And so um, one of you were asking this question about how can we help children to get in touch with their soul? It's, it's the same thing as for adults, so-called adults. Make sure that you actually have some time to play and have playfulness and things you think bring you joy in your life, even if they're small, tell a funny joke or cook or, you know, go out and, and uh, run around a little bit. Uh, I, I was reading an article uh, yesterday, I think it was, about here in Sweden, the, uh, a lot of teenagers are, have never been so stressed because they have so much homework, such a pressure to perform, and they're constantly being graded and, and their souls are being hollowed out. So if you can't do anything about that system, make sure that there is room to play in your child's life, even if they're 15, you know, or something that gives you joy. And also, again, this idea of space that we were talking about before, spaciousness, just sit with them or sit in nature or just listen and ask them one good question. Don't ask them a question like, what do you think you want to be or how did you do in school today? Like maybe ask a question like, did you hear something today that surprised you? Or what did you see today that you maybe have never seen before? Bring a sense of wonder, really simple, really easy and totally free. It's, it's really true. And uh, I came to remember a, 
another one of those magic moments in my life uh, uh, when I was, I guess I couldn't have been much more than six. And uh, I had uh, learned how to skip. <laughs> right? And uh, I really liked skipping a lot because uh, uh, I could get to, from A to B much quicker skipping than I could walking. And, and it was something much more uh, elevating about skipping than running. You know, running was, you know, running, that was uh, not so much fun as skipping in any case. And I remember uh, this one moment when uh, my mom picked me up after class, I guess it was first grade, and, and uh, we went to the supermarket. And she parked her car and uh, I said, uh, can we skip <laughs> to my mom? <laughs> and I never forget the look on her face. You know, she was a young woman, I guess she was about 30 something years old. And she said, yes, let's skip. And so we, we skipped together. It must have been about 100 meters from where she parked the car to the entrance of the supermarket. And by the time we got there, we were both just laughing so much. It was such a magic moment. Uh, play. Mm. Play is such a, a, a vital thing. So, so important. Mm. And uh, one of you asked uh, this question, if we care for the soul, will soul pods start to come back by themselves? Mm. And this can indeed happen. And, and this is about, you know, if you think of the soul as a garden and you're tending the garden, things just want to start growing. It's, you don't have to necessarily plant things all the time. You're just tending the soil, making it a good place to be, you know, making it a place full of thriving life. And so um, it can certainly happen that uh, soul pods come back and you might not even notice it. You might just find over time, you know, you look back and think, gosh, I really feel different than I did last year. And um, the other really important thing is that sometimes people come and they want a soul retrieval. They want, please, I need a part of my soul back and, and we can do that work and it's good. But then they don't make any changes. And so the soul comes back and it says, oh, but this isn't what I need. This isn't the place that I can thrive and grow and blossom. I'm leaving and going again. So nourishing the soul is a, is a wonderful way to also prepare for soul retrieval and to make sure that when it comes, it has good soil to grow in. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, oh, I like being here. Mm -hmm. uh I, I spent uh, many, many years doing soul retrievals and uh, because of the COVID, uh, I've sort of taken a little break from that. But uh, one thing that I have noticed is that when people have a spontaneous soul retrieval, uh, they tend to be much more powerful than the ones that are done for them. I say tend to be, it's not always the case, but because uh, sometimes it's been incredibly powerful. But when, when a soul part senses that you have changed, the conditions are different now. You have started to love yourself and that you are now, uh, a wonderful place to take up residence for that soul part. Right? It will come back spontaneously. And generally it happens when you're doing something that is really good for you to do in a soul nourishing way. And I've noticed also that uh, people have come to me for soul retrievals and and they've told me this story about this and that and the other thing. And then I go to do the soul retrieval for them. And I hardly have to go anywhere. Mm. Because that person 
has changed their life so much. And, and their awareness that they are, they have lost that part of themselves uh, is in a way uh, they've been calling out for it to come back mm -hmm. and saying, you know, listen, I'm not the same as I was 15 years ago when I spent myself, my life inside a bottle of whiskey, you know, I'm not that person anymore. And, and the soul hears this and, and, and starts on the way back home. So uh, very much doing these things that are soul nourishing, send signals to pieces of your soul that might have taken off years ago. And uh, I find that in about 98%, of cases, you know, um, soul loss isn't this very dramatic thing. It, it is this wearing down, the wear and tear when we are not being true to ourselves. And actually the soul, I think, is soul loss is a type of um, very clever uh, self-preservation because that part of the soul recognizes that this is not a good place to live. And instead of just drooping and dying, it says, listen, I'm going to go away for a while. I'm going to go over there and live over there. And then if ever, like, the time comes where you really want me back or, you know, you really want to change and you really want to live in a way that we, ah, the soul can feel alive, just let me know. You know, I'm right over there. And so uh, it's very, very beautiful, in fact, I've come to feel that the soul it wants to be with us. And it's not that it's leaving because it doesn't like us. It's just saying, I can't survive in these conditions. So then we change our conditions. And sometimes we have to go through deep healing processes and get a lot of help. Sometimes we might feel a lot of shame and guilt or sorrow. And that's okay. That is also part of the healing process. But even if we can't maybe love ourselves yet, we can feel that I want to be alive or I want to learn how to be more true to myself, to my soul. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this aspect of being true to ourselves and, and what that means from a sort of soul perspective, because again, it's not really about doing everything I want and having an easy life. It's really about being true to who you are in the essence you know, who you came here to be, what brings you joy, you know, what your natural gifts are, right? When you begin to recognize them, everybody has natural gifts, every single person, everybody has a potentially beautiful, vibrant soul, right? It is the ground it gets to grow in. And some people are a lot more privileged than others, have an easier time, and some people have a very hard time and still find an amazing um, way to grow their soul. One of my um, really big inspirations um, is a, a woman in, from the United States called Erica Huggins. And in the 60s, she was a, a, an integral part of the Black Panthers trying to work for uh, social change and creating a better life for uh, often Black people in urban deprived situations. And, um, she was put in jail for quite a long time and when she was in jail and her husband had been killed um, uh, she was facing great hardship and she decided that the only way that she could survive in jail was to begin to have a spiritual practice and so she began to have a spiritual practice and if you um, google her her name is Erica with a CK and then Huggins H-U-G-G-I-N-S there's some beautiful talks by her when she talks about um, having a spiritual practice, even when being incarcerated and feeling very alone and lost. And she's an amazing person. And so I feel what she was doing was saying, I, I'm not going to lose my soul. I might be, I have lost my freedom, but I'm not going to lose my soul. And she worked and worked and worked at bringing it back and creating a space inside of herself, even in prison that the soul 
could begin to thrive again and remember who it was because she knew why she had done these things. It wasn't to be violent or rebel. It was to uh, bring a better world to people that she cared about, to her people. So there are many ways that we can do this soul tending, whatever situations we're in. Right, and and by continuing her quest mm -hmm. in jail, because in fact that's what she did. Mm -hmm. Her her idea about being a, a Black Panther had nothing to do with uh, packing a automatic pistol and, and, yeah. and shooting people up. Yeah. No, 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 no. She was interested in helping people to have a better life, people in the ghettos. Right? And so there she was in a true ghetto. We don't get any more ghetto than prison. You know? And the only way to do that was to develop a spiritual practice and to share it. And, and that's exactly what she did. And she changed people's lives in prison. And, and this is a, a, a beautiful example. Uh, there's, there's always a way, there's always a way. And so a few minutes ago, uh, you were talking about uh, finding out what it is what it is that uh, you want from life. Mm -hmm. And none of you would be here right now if this was not something close to the top of your list, finding out what you want from life and how to get it. And again, it's nothing to do with uh, consuming goods. It's about how, how do I walk my path even better than I'm walking it now? How do I walk, walk it more harmoniously? How do I walk it with more awareness? How do I walk it with more love? How do I walk it with more compassion? How do I walk it with more understanding for what the world needs? You know, I, I know that all of you have been asking these questions to yourselves, and that's why we're here. And whatever the situation, we can find a way to be true to ourselves, to our hot wish, to our soul longing. And, and again, it doesn't have to happen overnight and we don't have to fully understand it, but we can make space to ask that question, to begin the inquiry. It is a, a journey, not a destination. You know, I, I don't always know where I'm going, but I know that I want to be fully alive and present as I'm doing it. And I want to be fully with myself. Um, I know that in earlier in my life, uh, I suffered soul loss because I wasn't ready to stand up for myself in different ways. I wasn't ready, and not to anyone else, but to myself, to stand with myself and say, you know, this is not right for me. Or um, when people are in a position of weakness, sometimes they have to do things that are not right for them. And that can cause soul loss. And it is also a means of survival, right? It's again, the, the body and the soul saying, this is what we can do right now to survive. And later on, we can go back and retrieve those soul parts and they'll be in a place where they're still kind of doing okay. So, and then um, after many years of healing, I began to feel like, you know, I kind of began to become aware that I spent quite a lot of my life sort of lying to myself, not out and out, but rather not being completely truthful with myself. And so then I started a practice of sort of trying to be more honest and genuine with what I felt, just in small ways, and not hide myself from myself. And 
sometimes this is not easy, but actually a lot of it, a lot of the time, it's really wonderfully enriching. And, and I do it by having a, a spiritual practice, by having a nature practice, and by having a sort of a writing with soul practice. And, and this is something I'm going to be offering more later on in the summer, these uh, writing with soul exercises. And if you sign up to our newsletter, then I will uh, send you information about that. And so again, um, we just make space to listen to ourselves more deeply. And it's not about whether I'm being truthful or a liar and, and judging that. It's just to try and touch the truth of my soul a bit more deeply today. It's not something I ever fully arrive at. It's, it's a way of being. It's a way of communicating. It's a way of, of uh, touching love. Mm -hmm. You, you told uh, something that got me to remember uh, an incredible experience in my life. Uh, a terrible experience was when I got drafted into the army. And uh, some of you have heard the story before, but it's worth repeating. What happened was that uh, that morning I gathered with about 30 other young guys and they herded us into a, a room, large room, and the sergeant came in and said, okay, listen to me, right? So we, we shut up and, and uh, he said, raise your right hand. And so he raised our right hands, repeat after me. And then uh, we swore to protect uh, the United States, the constitution of the United States, motherhood and apple pie and at the end of that he said okay take one step forward and we all took one step forward like a, a good flock of sheep and he said you have now stepped out of civilian life and into the armed forces of the united states and i felt a part of myself leave I had been dreading getting drafted and I had done everything that I could to avoid getting drafted. I had lost 30 pounds so that I would be too skinny to get drafted, right? Didn't work. Uh, they got me. Thank God that happened. Thank God I had that soul loss, that part of me that says, no, sir, no one step forward for me. <laughs> 25 steps back and out the back door. I'm getting out of here. Because the next two years were filled with experiences I could not have done if I was me. And I would have gone to jail or worse. And uh, I was very thankful I didn't go to jail. And finally, years later, I did have a soul retreat. And that part was brought back to me. And when that happened, I was able to accept finally all those things that I had experienced as a soldier. Not as good things, but as incredible teachings about how I wanted to live my life. Okay, maybe they were what some people might call negative teachings. But nonetheless, they were teachings. And I learned, I finally learned from all those experiences. And they've been a big part of your spiritual path, of your, Absolutely. Of your learning. Absolutely. And much deeper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after uh, I had my soul retrieval, very shortly after that, I realized there was something I had to do. And that was to return to Vietnam. 
and and I did that, and that was another life changing experience. In fact, it was it was about um, one of the most wonderful things I've ever experienced in my life. And you found yourself uh, welcome there, and welcome. I found back. incredibly mm -hmm. welcome back, unbelievably so. And a lot of deep healing and very deep change for your life. Every day, mm -hmm. every day was yeah. just, yeah. So there are so many ways we can work with this. So if you think you have suffered solace, don't worry, don't panic. Just begin to tend the soul that you have. Mm -hmm. Care for the soul that you have. And, and just in small ways, whatever you're able to do, don't worry if you're not able to do as much as you'd like. But just begin. Begin to do something small. And, and pay attention to how you use words to yourself and to others. You know, are you speaking the truth? It doesn't mean that you have to tell everybody everything. Um, but just pay attention to um, how it feels when you say certain things. Am I being true to myself here? It might not always be possible to say exactly what we mean. It might not always be desirable to say exactly what we mean. But can you say what you mean to yourself and begin that gentle, nurturing practice? And so before we finish, we just want to go on for a little bit longer because we want to shift this to a slightly bigger perspective. And that is what happens to the world when it becomes more filled with soul. And if you come on some of our animistic nature programs that are open to everybody, we will teach you how to begin to hear and come into contact with the soulfulness that is in... <coughs> Uh, nature, maybe uh, a lake or the air or the tree or the spirit of a rock, we can meet the world around us in a soulful way. And again, we don't have to define this. We don't have to explain how it happens, but we can experience it. And so my feeling is in these last 15, 20 years is that when I bring myself in a soulful way to the world around me, right? Even if it's in an urban environment, the world opens up and it responds. And it doesn't have to be like really dramatic or mystical, but suddenly I feel, again, this richness of life, you know, even if it is a bench in the park or even if it is a small rock, you know, on a, in a wall by a house, it is really fantastic how when we begin to fill up in soul and when we want to meet the soul in the world, you know, the ensouled world, the living world, and we recognize everything is alive uh, as we do in animism. Life grows exponentially. And even when we're going through hard times or difficult challenges, uh, life is there. Life is present. It's, it's so uh, true what you're saying, and uh, and in fact, it it is kind of easy. It's it's this thing about uh, stop thinking for a moment, right, and just be where you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had an incredible teaching one time from uh, a friend of mine who at the moment was uh, maybe uh, four years old. And uh, I used to live in a, a wonderful community in, in Copenhagen. And we lived kind of on the outside edge of it. And one day this little kid uh, goes running by on the path and I'm looking at him and he was such a, you know, just exuding little kidness, right? Really in a hurry, going someplace, very determined. And then all of a sudden he just stopped. And he turned and looked a little bit to the right. And he was 
just totally absorbed by what he saw there. And I'm like, look, I was inside. He didn't know I was there. I was inside. I was looking out the window. And I was like looking over him and saying, what is he looking at? What, what, <laughs> what is it he sees, you know? And he stood there for at least three minutes. And then all of a sudden, like he, you could see him coming out of this spell almost almost shaking and then uh, looking around a little bit and then whew, continuing, continuing. And this uh, expression, seeing with the eyes of a child came to me. And I don't know what he saw, but he was really seeing it. And this was such a, a, another beautiful lesson to me about stopping and being right in that moment, right in that moment. And uh, if you don't know yet how to meet, you know, the ensouled world to speak to rocks or water or air or plants or birds uh, don't worry the best first step is just to greet them you know walk around in the world and say i see you rock i see you tree and i believe that you are alive and maybe your soul and mine can meet maybe they can touch or have a conversation and then you can just sit on the rock or just lean against the tree or feel the wind or listen to the water you know and it's a good place to start by again making space you don't need to understand everything in order to do it it is an invitation to life to come closer so just greet them and say i'd like to get to know you i'd like to learn more about soulful living and i feel that as i said the, the world really responds in all our years of doing nature work i feel nature responds very fully to this and opens and shares very generously with us in nearly all the cases not every case but nearly all the cases and so in a way this is what we need more of in the world now you know we don't need more money or more stuff we need more love we need more care we need more soul and soulfulness and literally by each of us being filled a little bit more with soulfulness it adds exponentially to the vibration of soulfulness and the liveness in the world and then the world and nature also begins to vibrate with that and the spirits feel like they can come back they're here you know there are people who want to speak with them who want to feel them who want to play with them who want to be touched by them so just do something small and maybe for you know the rest of this year just do something small for yourself every day if you can or two or three times a week and just think how can I bring a little bit more soul or soulfulness into my life? How can I touch it? How can I enjoy it? How can I enjoy the soulfulness of life and know it is here? How can I open space in myself to that? And see what happens. It's a wonderful practice. And I think a lot of people are afraid they'll lose themselves mm. if they do this. But what I've experienced is that what happens is that people find themselves and they get to know themselves on a much deeper and joyful level. So we hope that this talk has been helpful and maybe even inspiring. 
And if you would like to come and learn more with us, we are very excited because we're going to be offering a new online course called Soul Care, and it will start in June, I think. It is for people who already know how to journey in the way we work. Um, but we'll also be, also be offering this uh, Writing for the Soul course in August. So both of these are wonderful ways to uh, step into caring and nourishing the soul in, in ways that work for you. And uh, if you haven't already signed up to our newsletter, please do so and you'll get information about this. And this talk will be up on YouTube in a few days or maybe a week or two. So um, enjoy life and be good to yourself. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for, for joining us today. And enjoy life. Thank you.